Of course, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and get as far with the question on your own first before listening on. We've gone ahead and drawn the picture uh, based on the description given in the question. It turns out that it's going to be useful for us to find an expression for this angle here, which we can call theta 1. And we're also going to want to find an expression for this angle here, which we'll call theta 2. Now you may notice that theta 1 is going to be equal to this angle down here. And basically the reason for that is because you have two lines running parallel to one another, and then you have a third line that I've inserted here cutting through them. And in that situation, those yellow angles would be corresponding. And you may remember from geometry that corresponding angles are equal to one another in that situation. So in order to find theta 1, it's going to be helpful to come back down here mark this angle as theta 1, and then use this right triangle to come up with our expression for theta 1. And in fact, to find theta 1, it will also be useful for us to find the hypotenuse of that right triangle, this one right here. So if we look carefully at the diagram, we have a right triangle, and this distance here is 2 centimeters, this distance here also is 2 centimeters, and you could do the Pythagorean theorem, or you may know that when you have an isosceles right triangle, then the hypotenuse is basically one of the legs multiplied by root 2. So this hypotenuse becomes 2 root 2 centimeters. Now, what I'd like to do is find an expression for the sine of theta 1, and we will see why the sine of theta 1 is going to be helpful to us. So the sine of theta 1 would equal the opposite over the hypotenuse. If we look at our triangle, the opposite side is 2, and the hypotenuse is 2 radical 2. So we can say that the sine of theta 1 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. We can then simplify. We can divide these 2's. Remember that leaves a 1 up in the numerator, so we can see that the sine of theta 1 is 1 over root 2. Now on to finding the expression for theta 2, this angle here which we can color in green. That angle turns out to be the same as this angle. In this case, again, a piece of geometry would help us here. We have two lines that are parallel to one another, cut by a third line. These alternate interior angles are congruent. So we can come down here and label this theta 2 as well. We have ourselves another right triangle in blue right here. We may wish to resketch that blue right triangle, which looks something like this. The length of this side right here was 3 centimeters. The opposite side is 2 centimeters. This is theta 2. We need the hypotenuse again. We'd have to use Pythagorean theorem here. There is no simple expression for the hypotenuse. So for now, we'll just call this C for the hypotenuse. We'll come down here. We remember that C squared is equal to 2 squared plus 3 squared. So C squared equals 4 plus 9, which is 13. And therefore, C is the square root of 13. So we'll come over here and label this hypotenuse the square root of 13 centimeters. And therefore, when we seek the expression for the sine of theta 2, we have sine of theta 2 equals opposite over hypotenuse. And this is a result that we're going to want to hang on to along with the expression for theta 1. Now, back to the picture. Q3 is positively charged, and so is Q1. So when two charges are of like sign, they're going to repel one another. So there's going to be a force that is pushing Q3 in this direction along this line. And we might wish to call that force F13. That simply represents the force between charges 1 and 3. Now, in part A of the question, we want the acceleration of this charge Q3 to be along the positive direction of the x-axis. So we want this Q3 to, 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 to accelerate in that direction, so basically to the right. Now, in order to do that, we're going to have a force that's pulling down and sort of to the right. And the reason for that is as follows. So if you go back to F13, there's going to be an X component to that force that points to the right, but there's also going to be a Y component that points upward.
we want to cancel out this y component and that way the particle q3 would only accelerate to the right now the only way to cancel out the upward y component of that f13 force is if there was a downward component therefore there must be a force which we can call f3 capital q which is going to point down and to the right so that the x component points to the right and the y component points down that way this y component and this y component would cancel out and that would leave the acceleration exclusively pointing in the rightward direction so this is the idea is that we're going to be setting the y component of f13 equal to the y component of f3q now each of those forces obeys Coulomb's law. We know Coulomb's law tells us the electrostatic force is equal to K multiplied by the magnitude of charge one multiplied by the magnitude of the other charge divided by the distance between them squared. So again, we are going to be setting the Y components of each force equal to one another. Let's start out with F13. We're gonna probably have to come down here and do this. So F13 would equal K multiplied by the magnitude of q1 times the magnitude of q3 divided by the distance between them squared but remember we only want the y component now you'll notice that the y component is opposite of theta one it's opposite of theta one so when you have a component opposite to your angle you're going to be using the sine to represent that component that y component so we would multiply this by the sine of theta one so there's our expression for F13, that is the Y component. We also need F3Q and just the Y component. So F3Q would equal K times Q3 times capital Q divided by the distance between them squared and then multiplied by the sine of theta2. So those are the expressions. Remember that we're setting them equal to one another and that way they'll cancel out. So I'm going to take this expression for the y component of F3Q and I'm going to set it equal to the y component of F13. And now we're going to begin to simplify this equation. We can cancel out the k's. We can actually cancel out the q3's. They appear on both sides. And now we want to start filling in the information so that we can solve for capital Q. Now, Q1 was given to us in the problem as having a charge of 40 microcoulombs. So we'll come down here and we'll say 40 microcoulombs divided by the distance between them squared. We established that that distance between Q1 and Q3 was the 2 radical 2. So we're going to have 2 radical 2 centimeters and this will be squared times the sine of theta 1. Well, the sine of theta 1 was 1 over root 2. So that's why we picked that up earlier. We'll set this equal to capital Q, which we don't know, divided by the distance between charges 3 and Q squared. The distance between charges Q3 and Q we discovered earlier was root 13. I erased the diagram, but it was root 13 if you want to go back and check that out. So this is root 13 centimeters squared, and then multiplied by the sine of theta 2. The sine of theta 2 was 2 over root 13. So now the rest is just some algebra. Let's pick up our calculators. Let's work out the entire quantity on the left-hand side of the equation. And when you do that, you're going to get 3.536. 3.536 equals... Now over here, we want to be careful. We're going to have Q times... On your calculator, you're going to want to punch this in right here. So this would be punched in as 2 over root 13 squared times root 13. And when you do that, let's see here. You shall get 0 0.043, roughly. And finally, divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.043. And you will find that capital Q is equal to 82.9. And this is going to come out to microcoulombs because we left the charges in microcoulombs.
Now we have to decide if it's positive or negative 82.9 microcoulombs. Remember that blue force marked F3Q, that was an attractive force, right? It was pulling Q3 towards capital Q. Well, Q3 was positive and Q would therefore have to be negative in order to have those opposite charges create that attractive force. So the final answer for capital Q in part A is negative 82.9 microcoulombs. Now in part B, we want the acceleration of Q3 to be along the y-axis. So in this case, we've still left in force F13, which is that repulsive force moving off up to the right. This time we want the x component to cancel. If we can get this x component to cancel, then there would only be this upward y component accelerating particle Q3 along the positive y-axis. So in order to cancel out that x component, we're going to have to make sure this time that the force F3Q will be pointing this direction. That way, its x component, which points to the left, will cancel out the x component of F13, and that would leave the acceleration pointing exclusively in the positive y direction. So in this problem, we're going to be setting this x component equal to this x component. For the x components, we're going to be needing the cosine of the angle rather than the sine. So back to our triangles, we can see that the cosine of theta 1 would equal the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Once again, these twos would cancel out, so the cosine of theta 1 is 1 over root 2. The cosine of theta 2 is the adjacent side, which is 3, divided by the hypotenuse, which is radical 13. So we're going to set up similar expressions for the two x components, equating them so that we can solve for capital Q. We'll erase this negative sign because, in fact, we'll see that capital Q is going to turn out to be positive. So let's equate the x components. So again, just notice we've used the expressions for cosine of theta 1 and cosine of theta 2. If we crunch down the left-hand side of the equation, we again get 3.536. The right-hand side becomes Q times 0.064. Divide both sides by 0.064, and you will find that capital Q in this case is 55.2 microcoulombs. Now, as for whether it's positive or negative, we alluded to this earlier. Remember that F3Q was a repulsive force. That is, Q3 was being pushed away from capital Q. And since Q3 was positive, in order to create a repulsive force, capital Q also would have to be positive. So positive 55.2 microcoulombs is the final answer to part B.